Beware Sunday school teachers and well-meaning parents. The Bible is not your average episode of My Little Ponies, but you knew that. What you didn't know was lurking beneath the surface is a story so unspeakable it'll send shivers down your spine and cause you to question well, your whole perspective of God. Well, at least according to this guy. The worst Bible story to teach kids almost never gets called out even though it's one we've all heard. First, legit trigger warning for violence. It's the Bible. Here we go. But first, hey, what's up, guys? My name is Isaac David, and this is The Daily Disciple, where I help you find Jesus and follow him daily. If you're new to the channel, subscribe, because I'm putting out new videos every single day. Thank you so much to everyone on Patreon. It is because of your guys' support that I can continue to make the content that I do in helping people follow Jesus daily. If you want to help support me, help us reach our goal of 300 patrons by the end of the year, head to the link in my bio. Now, on to the video. Here we go. The story of Jesus' death. Why is this ridiculous to teach kids? Not because he was torn to shreds with a whip. Not because of the crown of thorns. Not because he had to carry his cross on his raw back. Not because he was nailed to said cross probably through his wrist so it wouldn't tear out. Not because he hung there for six hours. Not because he was stabbed in the lung to make sure he was dead. And not because the other guys who were crucified at the same time had their legs broken so they'd suffocate quicker. Not because of any of that. Which most of us little Christians understood more or less in detail by the time we learned to read. No, the reason this story is up is because kids are taught that Jesus dad did this to him. His old man orchestrated the whole thing. To be fair, that is a pretty interesting twist. I watched that movie. How's there going to be comeuppance for Jesus dad? Nope. Sorry, kiddo. Jesus dad is the main character. He's the good guy. And you have to believe it's cool that he offed his kid like this or he's going to do worse to you. Anyway, I'm fine. How are you doing? <laughs> hey, if you like it when I feed the evangelical trolls with content like this, come along. I got more. Okay, so first, it's important to realize that within the Bible, there are stories that are gruesome, violent, and just tragic. So many of the stories within the Bible reflect real life. It doesn't sugarcoat judgment, wrath, or the consequences for sin. This is definitely evident within the Old Testament books, but also throughout the rest of the chapters of the Bible. Generally, unbelievers bring forward accusations against God for his actions in the Old Testament. But Abraham Piper here makes an accusation against God's action in the New Testament, specifically a charge brought against God the Father and his wrath poured out on his son, Jesus. It's important to know that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Godhead was not caught off guard when the Romans tried to crucify Jesus and ultimately they were successful in it. This wasn't a surprise to God. It's not like God the Father was up in heaven and had to be notified by one of the angels. God, do you know what's going on? They're crucifying Jesus. God the Father is like, oh my goodness, I could have never seen this coming. It's like the same people that think that God the Father was caught off guard by Jesus' death are the same people that <laughs> think God was caught off guard by Adam and Eve's sin. It's like, no, it's all part of the plan. It wasn't like they had some great plan to militarily overthrow the Romans, but it was snuffed out before the revolution could get going. No, Jesus was always supposed to die a shameful death. The prophet Isaiah foretold of Jesus' death hundreds of years before it happened, also testifying to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, here in Isaiah 53, 4-6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus was supposed to die. This wasn't a surprise to God. This wasn't an accident. But he died for specific purposes. What are they? Well, I'd like to put forward that Jesus died to satisfy the wrath of God. You see, in Romans 5, 1, it makes it pretty clear. It says, since therefore we have been justified by his blood, that is Jesus, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. However, some people can't come to terms with the fact that God is wrathful. That doesn't seem to align with their understanding of God. You know, God's all kind of warm and fluffy and, you know, he's just like a nice guy. Why would he be wrathful? wrathful or, or judgmental. So in order to kind of um, fix this disconnect they have in their mind, they create the following fictitious scenario. In this scenario, the devil is in charge and Jesus needs to die in order to buy our souls back from the devil. In essence, it's a deal with the devil. In this scenario, the wrath of God doesn't need to be satisfied. The wrath of the devil is the real thing that needs to be satisfied. I often think of Greek mythology when people start promoting this kind of theological perspective 
perspective or ones like it. You see, Hades is the god of the underworld. He has certain rights and responsibilities. He's kind of evil, and yet he serves a certain purpose in keeping things in order and managing those who are fit to be cast into the underworld. Okay, so let me make this clear. Satan is not in charge of hell. He's not down there partying or judging or torturing. He's not the, the slave master down there conducting things. No, he is a liar and deceiver and will be cast into the lake of fire. That's not to say that Satan isn't active in our world. He is, and he is an extremely destructive force. But know this, God has dominion over Satan. Jesus did not die to buy us back from the devil or satisfy the wrath of the devil. He died to fulfill the wrath and judgment of God. Now, you may be asking yourself, why is God so judgmental and wrath-filled, and why is he pouring that out on his son? Can't he just chill? He sounds less like a good, good father and more like an abusive father if he's going to go to that extent to punish his own son. These are important questions to ask because they put into question the goodness of God. But to figure this out, we need to understand the stakes at hand. Humanity was created in the image of God. God called it very good. Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and through Adam, we have all inherited a sinful nature, which means we have a tendency towards sin. Also, because of Adam's sin, we now encounter death, something that was not present in the perfection of the garden in the beginning. And now, as humans, we are in bondage to the power presence and penalty of sin. There is nothing humanity could do or can do to free ourselves from the bondage of sin. Because of that, the Bible says that we are storing up for ourselves the wrath and judgment of God because of our sin and rebellion against him. Now, you can imagine that is not a very popular message. You won't hear a lot of even pastors these days talking about the wrath and judgment of God because it turns a lot of people away. It's not the nice, warm, fluffy God that we're often used to hearing about. Many people don't like to see God as a judge. They prefer to see him as the loving father that he is, but he is also a judge. If I think I can walk enough old ladies across the street to make up for my own sin, then I'm sorely mistaken. Because just because I decide to start doing nice things and helping people out, that doesn't make up for the sin and the crime that I've already committed. Somebody needs to pay that price. See, the Bible is setting up a beautiful and breathtaking moment. So we're standing before the judge guilty for breaking his law. We say, oh no, I'm a good person because we're comparing ourselves to other people. But when we compare ourselves to God's perfection, we fall infinitely short. So we are standing guilty before God. But then the judge's son steps forward and says, I will take their penalty on myself. You're stunned. You can't say anything. In a moment, your life has changed because of the sacrifice of another. But here's the beautiful thing about Jesus as the Savior. He did not go to the cross begrudgingly. He went willingly. So when people accuse God the Father of being this abusive, uh, tyrannical father, pouring out the wrath on his son who, who doesn't deserve it, they're missing the point. Jesus loved the world so much, and God the Father loved the world so much that not only God the Father gave his son, but Jesus gave himself up willingly for us. He died so that you could be freed from the power of sin, the penalty of sin, and one day the presence of sin when he makes the new heavens and new earth. Because God is good, he has to punish sin, but in his mercy, he provided a way out. Not only that, but he's given you a path to become a new creation. When we put our faith in him, we become something new. The old self is gone. The new has come. That is amazingly good news, not of an abusive father who tyrannically pours out his wrath and judgment on his only son, but a good and loving father who sacrificed his own son and his son gave himself up willingly to die for his people. Like, are you kidding me? That is such good news that should be shared with your nieces, with your nephews, with everybody in your Sunday school, with everybody that you can possibly share it with. It is the gospel it is the good news. There's nothing better. Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, I encourage you to give it a like down below and subscribe because I'm putting out new videos every single day. Once again, a huge shout out to everyone on Patreon. It is because of your guys' support that I can continue to make this kind of content um, and fulfill this mission that I believe I've been given by God to help people follow Jesus daily. So thank you so much. I love seeing all your faces on our monthly uh, video calls where we discuss different topics. It's always a blast hearing from you guys. And if you want to join in on those, um, join 
Patreon, and I'd love to meet you and get to chat with you. Thank you so much for watching again, guys, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye!